like your background, Alan. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Both the uh, the toy side and the uh, video and the side. film side. Yeah. No, I, I we aim to please here. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so Sean, you're the director, and Trevor, you're yes. the producer. Is that am I yes. right? Okay. Right. Well, let's talk and about. Oh yeah, Trevor is also a, a writer on the film as well. Okay. Very good. Uh, so let's talk about uh, Petro. Uh, what what is the film? What uh, what is the basis? So, yeah. So the film is a feature length documentary about um, Gustavo Petro and the Colombian progressive movement in Colombia. So uh, Petro is a former uh, M nineteen uh, guerrilla, uh, demobilized and uh, subsequ subsequently became a congressman and a senator and then um, mayor of Bogota in 2011. Uh, and he ran unsuccessfully for president twice. Um, and in 2021, uh, we saw some early polling that, that indicated that he may have a chance of winning the 2022 presidential election. And so we got in touch with him through a, uh, a producer on this project, who's a close friend of ours who had known Petro for many years through his family. And Trevor and I actually um, originally made a couple of student films about uh, this subject matter um, and followed Petro way back in between 2005 and 2007 um, with mini DV cameras when we were college students. And so 15 years later, you know, we came back uh, to revisit some of the same um, stories, but also tell the story of the country through um, this kind of uh, historical turning point of the first time that the progressive left um, uh, was elected in Colombia. And, um, you know, we didn't know, we didn't have any certainty about what the outcome would be, um, but we followed uh, Petro's campaign from roughly September of 2021 until he won the election in June of 2022. Um, and so what we hope uh, for this is the audiences will kind of um, you know, get a political history of Colombia, as well as um, this understanding of the backstory of Gustavo Petro's uh, political formation and biography, and get an exciting look at a, a very um, dynamic presidential campaign um, last year. So yeah. that's kind of the, the overview. Yeah, I was gonna say, you just gave away the ending of your movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, so why 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 i guess uh i mean you, you talked about your interest in colombian history and and obviously we have a a landmark presidential election but what was what was the reason behind making the film what what were your personal motivations yeah um i would say that from a personal level um sean and i through our experience meeting Petro 15 years ago. Um, that was one of the reasons that led us to pursue a career as documentarians um, was the experience of making that film, that short film all that time ago with him, and also uh, helped develop sort of a lifelong interest in, in Latin America and in Colombia. So really, we've been looking to make this film for, for about 15 years. Uh, and there's actually been sort of various different moments where we thought there would be different uh, uh, sort of entry points to g tell us a, a nuanced story about Colombian politics um, that would resonate with global audiences. Um, uh, we tried to do that with the demobilization of the FARC um, a number of years ago. It didn't end up working out that way, but this felt like a great entry point um, to tell an exciting election story that personally was very poignant to us, um, but also would have these universal themes that we felt like people in America, people in Europe, people who were are dealing with hyperpolarized politics heading into their own elections in very similar circumstances to what we see in the film um, could really grab onto some of the themes and some of um, the takeaways that uh, was the Colombian experience in 2022. So it sort of checked a lot of boxes. There was a it was a personal um, story and a personal endeavor, but also something that we felt um, was very relevant. 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty uh, incredible that you got access to a a legit uh, presidential campaign. Uh, how did how did that happen? Um, and what were I mean, is I should have looked you guys up earlier, but, uh, you know, have you guys been doing documentaries like this? And um, so, yeah, I mean, how did you get into uh, the actual campaign? Yeah, so uh, Trevor and I have been making documentaries in Latin America for many years um, and worked in, you know, Argentina, Chile, Dominican Republic, um, Guatemala, a lot of different places. And um, so that, you know, it's been a focus of ours. And uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, our uh, one of our collaborators, uh, Julian Roberts Espinel, um, is Colombian American, and uh, his mother and father um, were very and continue to be very involved in um, Colombian human rights and <laughs> advocacy, and also are considered sort of, um, you know, uh, a stopping point in Washington, D.C., where we grew up um, for leaders who are coming to visit D.C. from Colombia. Um, for meetings and that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, we uh, came back to talk to Petro uh, in 2021 through Julian and his family's connection to to Petro. And, and that was how we were able to start this conversation about the idea of following the campaign. Um, so we weren't complete strangers to him um, when we started discussing this possibility um, although I like to joke that I, I'm still not convinced that he knows my name, um, <laughs> but he, uh, he knows, uh, who we are. And I think that probably he did have a vague memory of us as, as college students coming and following him around, um, back way back in 2006 and 2007. Um, so, you know, uh, I think the challenges of, of following the campaign were, really just the fact that it it intensified a lot, um, especially starting in January um, and continued to ramp up through the spring and and obviously into the the final stretch leading up to the election in June. I mean, um, what was the pitch like to him? I, I, I imagine you weren't necessarily doing a, uh, you know, doing a, you know, you were, I'll say, a, you know, you weren't there to pump up his campaign no. But uh, what was what was your pitch to him? And what yeah, so think, our our, what our cinematographer, possible? yeah, our cinematographer Tom LeFay and I um, went and met him uh, at his office in the Colombian Senate, which I believe might actually be the same office that he has been in for many years now. Um, and he sort of said, "Okay, you know, you have five or ten minutes of my time. Like, more or less, what do you want? You know." And uh, I explained to him that we saw potential in um, his campaign and that we thought there was a, a good chance that he might win the election and and that we wanted to be there to sort of witness it and um, that we, we hoped that at, at minimum he could give us um, some of his time, you know, in between meetings and campaign rallies and all the rest of his very busy schedule to kind of give us a sense of of what his vision was for the future of the country and and kind of give us a little bit more um, <clears throat> sort of a different perspective than what he might give to a typical, you know, news media um, outlet. And I think that to some degree, you know, he ended up following through on that. Um, he was very clear to us and that he wasn't making any promises about sort of the level of access or, you know, I, I don't know that he really realized at the time how much we would be sticking around uh, versus, you know, the typical kind of parachuting in of uh, somebody doing a, a newscast or a, a segment for TV where they come in for maybe uh, four or five days tops um, and then go back and and cut something together. Um, and And so, that actually helped us build trust not only with him, but with the people around him um, because we kept showing up. And I actually relocated to Colombia for over a year in order to tell this story. And um, so we were really committed to it um, once we got that kind of agreement from him. And, you know, obviously as filmmakers, you want, you always want more access than what you get. And I think that we would have loved to revisit some of the 
key places, um, you know, like his uh, looking at his early days in Sipakira when he was a union organizer as a young man and and maybe going back to his childhood home in on the Colombian coast. But, you know, uh, like I think Trevor had mentioned maybe in another interview, we were kind of at the last priority for him. And yeah. I mean, he's running for president. <laughs> exactly. So I think we were just lucky and thankful to get what we did get. And I think that there were moments where he was very candid and, and opened up um, in terms of talking about how he was feeling. And I think that we are, uh, to this day, feel really fortunate that that we achieved that kind of level of trust with him. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's something that really stuck out to me in the documentary <clears throat> was the fact that, you know, you know, you were you're just more or less a fly on the wall, and mm -hmm. that it. I, I think it might have hurt the film had you gotten more access to him and, you know, allowed him to, you know, politics so to speak, or or the yeah. temptation to politic, and and I think you succeeded in that to, mm -hmm. to just kind of say here's here's how a presidential campaign was run in Colombia. Yeah. Um, the other thing about your documentary, I call it open <clears throat> to documentaries because you don't you don't know how it's going to end. Uh, was there a great amount of risk in terms of the time and resources you were putting into this? Had he not won the um, the first primary, um, you know, obviously, I, I think the ending could have gone either way and you would still had a film. But were there moments along the way where it's like, you know, were there certain tent poles you had to hit in order to say, hey, we have a complete film and we can actually make this movie? I would say I would say that it's always a gamble. You know, I mean, we definitely went into it open eyed about the fact that it was a presidential campaign and anything could happen. Um, we all know what to expect, what to think of polls, you know, after 2016. It's, you know, they could yeah. say one thing and the result could be completely different. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we were really fortunate to to eventually construct sort of a constellation of believers in the film both from a financing side and from people on the ground, um, collaborators that we worked with, you know, it was really important um, <clears throat> to have that level of support because there were plenty of moments where, you know, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. it, it there was despair at times <laughs> where we felt, you know, how could we possibly go on with this project given what's just happened? Um, but, you know, we did, um, you know, Sean and I are pretty stubborn um you know and we we did persevere with it but but yeah i mean any project of this nature speak for yourself it's trevor <laughs> it's a gamble it's a gamble um luckily for us it worked out yeah i mean do you think uh in hindsight that there would have been a movie had he lost the primary i think it would have been a film uh it would have been a different film and it was something that sean and i discussed many many times um was how to adapt for that uh, eventuality. I mean, we shot an enormous amount of material for this, hundreds of hours. Um, we we had plenty of characters that ended up on the cutting room floor. I mean, we tried to sort of cover our bases with filming different levels of material that we felt like might play um, if the outcome was different. Uh, you know, we we tried to include quite a few different voices in the film and we tried a variety of different edits and scripts for it um, that, you know, after being tested and, you know, workshopped, we ended up with what we have now. But um, that's not to say that it wasn't always a perennial concern of, of how to sort of get ahead of the fact that you can't know what the outcome is going to be and you don't want to be in a position where, you know, you're caught flat footed and, and, your project now is a failure. Um, so it just would have been, it would have been a different story. Um, I like the story that we have. And I think that uh, hopefully audiences will too. Yeah. So uh, let's get into the politics of it all. Uh, you know, the, the problem with the political documentary is, you know, we live in a divided world. Uh, I, I, I was gonna say nation because, you know, we know what's going on in the US, but Clearly, you show in Colombia, it's a divided country, uh, just like ours. Um, you know what? What were the discussions in terms of? Uh, I, I mean, I'll just throw it out there. I'm not. I'm not exactly a socialist, um, but you are following the socialist candidate. Um, 
you know, what were the discussions into how to frame his story uh, and to to get a, a a film that appeals to a broad audience that that hits both sides of the of the uh, political aisle? Yeah, I mean, I would say neither Trevor nor I are socialists, and I, I wouldn't even necessarily say that Gustavo Petro is a socialist. I would argue that he's more of a social democrat. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were very uh, interested in sort of looking at this phenomenon of polarization as a mirror of what's happening worldwide in, in every country. And you look, you see these extremes um, playing out in political discourse in the United States going into our own election year, um, but also uh, in Latin America, historically, uh, at least in, in my lifetime, we've seen a lot of uh, sort of the pendulum swinging back and forth um, between these kind of right wing authoritarian governments and then these more progressive left uh, populist governments, um, you know, an example of which is uh, Brazil, you know, they had the uh, the scandal that took down Lula, and then you had Bolsonaro, and now Lula is back. And so it's sort of like, well, after Lula, are they going to go back to uh, a right wing uh, presidency? Uh, time will tell. But I think that, um, you know, we saw an opportunity to look at the this kind of historic progressive ascendancy of the progressive left in Colombia, which is something that had never happened. They had never dislodged um, the sort of ruling class from uh, from power. And actually, what an interesting thing that Petro said in a podcast a few months ago is that um, he has the presidency, but he doesn't have the power. Um, in his mind, uh, so many of the institutional um, actors um, are still sort of connected to, um, uh, you know, the the real power that runs the country. And it's very hard for one president to, um, to, to maneuver around that. Um, and, and I think that has actually been a challenge for him in terms of getting reforms passed. And, you know, I remember Barack Obama talked about how a country is sort of like, you know, steering an enormous ship or boat where you know you kind of try to move it as much as you can in one direction and maybe it moves like just ever so slightly in that direction but you're not in a position where you can make drastic changes quickly or easily and um yeah i mean getting back to your original question i think you know um it was a compelling opportunity for us to to look at the political landscape through the story and life of a man whose own um, trajectory mirrors a lot of the most po important political events of the last 40 years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in terms of him being a socialist, that's certainly how his um, his opponents had characterized him. Yeah. And, uh, and and what stuck out to me about him was, you know, th this 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 guiding force of bringing peace to Colombia. Yeah, you know, a very fractured country and yeah. and trying to bring the you know i guess the most extreme elements of that together especially mm -hmm. when you have a you know a country that had been run by conservative rule for a very long time mm -hmm. you know as they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely you know there yeah. there's that you've got to have that kind of balance the uh you know the other side to kind of balance things out and yeah. i think that's what that felt it, you know, as much as I say he's a socialist, it felt like he was trying to unify the country. And yeah, I think that he, that was absolutely his goal was to bring together a broad coalition of, um, from across the political spectrum, you know, he made um, some early alliances, which have sort of fallen apart now with the Liberal Party and with the Green Party. Um, and I, I think that this perception of him as this, you know, arrogant, um, intractable you know or, or rigid person who doesn't want to meet with people across the aisle is is more propaganda than anything because he has shown um, himself to be open to figuring out how to talk to the opposition and he's even met with Alvaro Uribe his nemesis 
um, no less than three or four times since he took power. So, or since he took the presidency. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, just to or go ahead, John. No, go ahead. Uh, just to to build on that, I mean, you know, Latin America, not to overgeneralize, but it is a region that has seen real right wing dictatorships and fascism, and also real left wing communist dictatorships yeah. uh, and authoritarianism. I mean, they've they've seen sort of the worst that both extremes of the political aisle can bring to the table. So when you see, you know, there's a lot of fears that can be exploited from people of whatever political persuasion that you have, and it contributes to this really sort of pernicious polarization um, where when you see the word communist, Petro's communist, Petro's socialist, that doesn't mean he's Bernie Sanders, you know, yeah. in Colombia. That means he is... Fidel Castro, you know, I mean, it's like the connotation he, is he's not really what the current power is. <laughs> yeah, the connotation is very different than, say, what we might interpret here. But that was a really interesting phenomenon for us to kind of unpack, you know, and that was one of the reasons that we thought his candidacy was so relevant and interesting was because, like you say, he he is sort of subverting some of these political labels, trying to build this bigger coalition and with, uh, in our minds, you know, an admiral goal of this to bringing total peace um, to Colombia. So, you know, we didn't want to shy away from showing the fears that he inspired in some of his political um, opponents. I mean, we wanted to very much to include them. We, we, we actively tried to get Alvaro Uribe to participate in the film. Um, we, uh, we interviewed some of his most strident critics um, who are in the film. We filmed with his uh, political rivals during the campaign. I mean, you know, we took real steps to to create that drama too, because as as filmmakers, you know, you want you want drama, and you're not going to get it if you're just pre uh, presenting one one side of the argument here or making propaganda or whatever. Um, we, you know, you have to sort of respect your audience, um, give them a sophisticated uh uh offering and hope that they create their own takeaways um so hopefully that's what we've done yeah i mean the last political thing i say is i, I feel like especially in the united states we have so much the two sides have so much in common that if we just legislated based on what we had in common uh everything else will kind of work its way out and i think that's kind of what he was he was going for and uh and of course we gotta we gotta take those people out so to speak uh you know, because power is power and people love it. Um, so let me, uh, oh yeah. So you, you guys are at, uh, are you premiering at Slam Dance or? Uh... We are premiering uh, our US premiere at Slam Dance. We previously had our world premiere at the Morelia Film Festival in Mexico um, at the end of October. And uh, we recently screened at the Havana Film Festival in cuba and we're planning on uh doing more screenings and film festivals after slam dance but those are still tbd okay so how i mean how did those premieres go uh, especially the one in havana really, really well um you know mexico was absolutely incredible uh morelia has a really strong programming slate every year i had been to that festival a couple times in the past um as an audience member and was fortunate to go as a participating filmmaker this time um, with Trevor and a couple other members of our team. And, uh, you know, uh, it was interesting because a, a number of Colombians who live in Mexico um, as sort of Colombian expats there uh, came to our screening and had a really visceral emotional response to the film. And, um, you know, one of them, one of the people who got up during our, our Q&A had herself been internally displaced in Colombia. And uh, so I think that these are people who have never seen this story or their story told exactly in this way. Um, and that really uh, resonated with people on a deep emotional level, which I think um, was very moving for all of us and particularly us as outsiders um, to sort of recognize that we may have tapped into something deeper for people who are from that country um, is kind of like the best possible gift that, that we could get from having made this film. And, um, you know, then when we went to Havana, um, very, you know, a couple of weeks ago, 
It was great because, uh, you know, obviously the circumstances in Cuba are very difficult. People, there's a lot of economic hardship, a lot of people trying to leave the island. But, um, you know, uh, the film tickets were 30 cents uh, to get in. And if people couldn't pay, they usually just let them in for free anyway. And so it actually created this, uh, allowed for this um, audience who might not normally get to go see a film like this to see um this on the big screen and and I was very touched by the fact that you know people came up to me and wanted to engage in conversation and dialogue and and take pictures all together after the screenings and um it didn't feel like I, we were dealing with sort of like a jaded uh film festival going audience but rather you know a group of real people who you know had their own opinions and and maybe saw some parallels you know it's interesting because a lot of the uh scare tactics and propaganda during petra's campaign from the from the right wing and from certain parts of the news media were basically saying you know petro is going to turn colombia into cuba or venezuela and destroy the country through communist um policies and that kind of thing and and we haven't seen that materialize in the last year and a half. Um, but I was interested in in kind of the perception among Cubans about sort of how they felt about some of the rhetoric. And, you know, if I go back, I would love to screen it for more folks and, and see what their feelings are on it. Um, but uh, I, th I feel just really lucky to be involved and in screening at some of the best festivals in the world. And, and Slam Dance is going to be the next piece of that for us. Yeah, I mean, we we at Film Threat, we're we love Slam Dance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's kind of the one we look forward to when we're <clears throat> in our city. What what is about Slam Dance that, that excites you this year? I mean, Slam Dance is a standard bearer for kind of alternative um, voices and has been, I think, since since its inception in 1995, I believe it was. Um, I've always heard about it, you know, uh, other filmmaker friends of ours have had films screen there and, uh, you know, we've looked at the, the programming slate for this year and there's a lot of other really cool and exciting uh, films to see and uh, I went to Park City once in 2017 because uh, I worked on the camera side on a documentary about Guatemala called uh, 500 Years that played at Sundance, but I think just being in Park City and and kind of uh being in touch with the energy of the place and and being able to connect with like-minded filmmakers is something that we're really excited to do and um you know we're going to be packing our, our long underwear for that experience but uh the slam dance team has been great so far and um i'm honestly just looking forward to going and seeing other films too all right so last question um what advice you you i again i, I do this uh i called you guys an open-ended documentary so you don't know how it's going to end but what what piece of advice would you give to a friend who wants to do a similar type documentary uh what what were the keys to uh to making your film a success don't do it <laughs> why do all documentarians say that <laughs> Trevor can I, answer this one. i think uh i i would say you know we this was open-ended in the sense that we didn't know who was going to win the election, but there were sort of guardrails in place that we set out to shoot the election. And it wasn't going to be a film about Petro's presidency. It wasn't going to be a film about what happened after. It's like there's a start and a finish. Giving yourself some some boundaries um, is often a good storytelling device, and it will definitely help preserve your sanity. Mm -hmm. So and you're saying that there oh, are temptations of rabbit trails. Uh, well everyone's always like well you should keep shooting you know let's just keep going and it's like no <laughs> you know you just you want to finish this thing um yeah remembering why you're making it too you know i think we i would have been really disappointed in us if we had given up and i actually almost quit the project once or twice because it was there was a lot of frustration involved and a lot of challenges with you know budget and logistics and all of it and access um but if you just kind of have as your north star remembering why you are working on something um then you you'll kind of be able to weather the storm all right 
Well, thanks, Sean. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, Petro is playing at Slam Dance, and I will say uh, it's it kind of gives a hopeful light to the sausage machine that politics is. And uh, I thank you for for uh, talking with me today. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you.